so uh, welcome to this next short paper. Rebecca, we look forward to hearing from you and uh, for you answering our questions. So. Thank you. There has been a turn in the last few decades in a host of fields in the humanities and sciences to studies of what's loosely called embodiment. And this has made its way into theology and religious studies. Recently, uh, Donovan Schaefer's 2015 book, Religious Affects, for example, argues for animal religion and indeed the animal origins of all religion through affective forces in the body. On the more theological side, Simeon Zoll's recent The Holy Spirit and Christian Experience, published in 2020, looks at affect theory for explaining how the Holy Spirit moves and transforms our lives at the level of subjective experience, and indeed talks about the connection between experience and belief. My talk is not about just another form of embodiment, but I'd kind of like to zoom out a bit and talk about the conceptual frameworks, which I believe have driven discussions of embodiment to date, and what gets defined as the body. I'm going to do this by using a paradigm in the cognitive sciences called embodied cognition. And because it's gonna be a very broad sketch, I'm kind of trying to tilt in a new direction. I'm only gonna have time to kind of point out this direction. So I hope people will ask specific questions about embodied cognition at the end. Because I don't have a PowerPoint, um, I think last year at SRF my PowerPoint didn't work and I've been a bit traumatized by PowerPoints <laughs> not working. So I've kind of written it out, but I wanna give five bullet points of the structure um, of my talk, just so you can have mental peg holds. First, I'm going to highlight how current studies in embodiment do in fact show that there's no clear distinction between the body and mind. And here the mind is often equated with soul and I'm going to use it in that equation and we can duke it out afterwards, uh, the problems with that. Then I'm going to show how current philosophical frameworks are restricted and can only flip between monism and a substance dualism. But I'll propose that embodied cognition perhaps does not fall prey to the same pitfalls as other studies in embodiment, such as affect theory. And then I'm going to propose a different ontology, a different philosophical framework, that of hylomorphic dualism. And I'll conclude by showing how I think embodied cognition shows some resonances with hylomorphism as a philosophical framework for looking at the relationship between the body and soul. So I shall begin. Often, recent approaches to embodiment have taken the form of conglomerating affect, emotion, experience, subjectivity, these seemingly non-quantifiable subject aspects of our existence as something that happens in a thing called the body. And this is seen in something, as something kind of almost novel, which we've discovered and now needs to be accounted for in our higher order systems of rational conscious beliefs. And this is happening in theology at a twofold level. That is, there's been this effort to try to show how we can account for the importance of the body in our theological anthropology, and how we can account for the body in the actual process of theological reasoning itself, or how we come to those beliefs, here notably our beliefs about ourselves as human beings. And this has been largely driven by studies in affective and cognitive neuroscience, which do seem to show that our so-called higher order faculties are inextricably influenced and in some senses directed by our emotional bodily affective orientations and responses to the world. And often this happens before the level of conscious awareness. It's a sort of orientation of thought. And I'll give here just one example of a study illustrated by the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio. There was an experiment that Damasio did, um, he and his colleagues did, where they took two decks of cards. And what they were trying to do was investigate the effects of the frontal lobe in decision making. And the frontal lobe is often kind of seen as a contributing center um, for things like emotional control and behavior. And they had two decks, a bad deck and a good deck, which were unknown to the patients, but were associated with either financial reward or penalty. And somehow the players who had normal brain function and began to adjust without consciously developing this strategy, indeed they couldn't articulate why they were adjusting, to pick more of the good decks and less of the bad decks. And more importantly, their galvanic skin conductance response would change right before picking the bad decks. The interesting thing, Damasio says, and this is a quote from this study, we know from the situation of patients um, who lose the covert biasing system, patients with damage to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex or to the amygdala, that the decision apparatus is impoverished to a dramatic degree. So the patients with some kind of brain damage um, did not have the same skin conductance response and had compromised decision-making skills and couldn't readjust their behavior to pick fewer of the bad decks. So this is taken to kind of show that conscious decisions are guided by pre-conscious bodily responses that orient action and thought. I would argue, however, that whether it's through affect theory or neuroscience, which shows that the body and mind are more intimately and causally linked than has hitherto been thought, there's still in all of this a kind of tacit ontology which should be interrogated. 
This is an ontology which reduces the body to the causal world of matter and tries to give an account for it solely in terms of matter explicable through the laws of physics. And so while we try to explore if there's a separate mind and soul and account for how that the soul could affect the body causally, we assume that the body in this equation is just kind of physical extension. In all of these, the supposition is that matter exists in the physical realm of extension without anything else needed to sustain its existence, and this leaves the option of either a monism or a dualism. So a quick breakdown of dualism, and I'm going to here use the term dualism in the sense of substance dualism, because contemporarily when we talk about dualism, that's often what's referred to. And I'm going to try to tease out a distinction within dualism itself later, but when I refer to dualism here, I'll try to use the word Cartesian dualism, because that's what it's often referring to. And of course, we're all aware of the Cartesian problem, which is if there are two types of substance, one physical, one non-physical, how, how can they relate? And what causal effects might they have on each other? And even though recently the focus has flipped from how the mind might affect the body to studying how the body might influence the mind, there's still this idea that the body and mind are separate. And this means we need to account for their relationship to each other in terms of laws of cause and effect, cause here being modeled on the laws of physics. And often when this problem can be solved in dualism, there's a sweep to the other end of the spectrum by prioritizing the reality of only one of these substances. So if you're a reductive physicalist, it's the body that gets priority in reality. And here I mean the colloquial term for the body that's just physical extension. And then the soul, consciousness, mind, in short, anything which is not physical becomes, as Mary Midgley puts it, just more froth on top. If you're an idealist, then you prioritize the reality of the mind and the physical becomes incidental. Uh, Patrick Brecker has a really interesting breakdown of monism, and he says you have two types of monism. You have mental monism, and for a mental monist, the physical world is a mental construct, or you have physical monism, and physical monism has two branches. You're either a reductive physicalist, in which, and he, he calls it, the, men the mental can be reduced to the physical, or you're a non-reductive physicalist, in which the mental is an emergent property of the physical, so that it transcends the physical, and even to the point of having top-down causal effects on the physical world. But it's important to note that of these three options, substance dualism, reductive physicalism, non-reductive physicalism, these all kind of fall into the two broader categories of either as an essentially substance dualism or a monism. And there's still this presumption that if you have that you have this physical and non-physical realm. And if you're a dualist, you have both. If you're a monist, you have one or the other, you can take your pick. If these were options, it seems that physicalism is in fact the most viable option because studies in the cognitive sciences and cognitive neuroscience are pointing fairly conclusively to the fact that the mind does not exist as an independent substance. There's no central thing that can be found that we can point to and say, aha, that's, that's the mind. And not even really a, a part, a processing unit in the brain. Indeed, studies in embodied cognition show that there is very possibly no central processing unit at all when it comes to mental activity. In other words, thinking is not an input-output calculation, but rather all mental activities can be seen as emergent properties of the body in its interaction with the environment. In other words, we don't create representations of the world in our head, but we rather use the world itself, as Francisco Varela says, as its own model. Two quick examples of this. Um, Imagine a baseball player trying to catch a ball, and it used to be thought, according to the traditional cognitivist paradigm coming out of the 1950s, that a baseball player is running, he's trying to catch the ball, his mind is doing all these background calculations about velocity and arc to try to get to the ball in time. But instead, an embodied cognition theorist would say, well, actually, maybe he's just keeping the ball straight in his line of sight. He's using the environment itself to calculate where the ball is. Um, I like to use the analogy, I think it might have been Andy Clark, of, of the, the tuna fish. when. Scientists were first starting to study the tuna. They were confused by how the tuna could actually be as fast as it was, because if you look at the pure statistics on paper of its weight, size, it shouldn't be able to maneuver as quickly as it does. And then they realized that the tuna fish not only was using the natural currents, but creating its own eddies and vortices to gain the speeds that it did. And so there's this idea that the speed of the tuna is this emergent property of the organism in interaction with its environment. And there are examples that I don't have time to give now, but if anyone wants to talk about them, robotics has taken this on board and they've tried to kind of recreate animal behavior without a central processing unit, just laying different types of domain specific behaviors on top of each other. Um, but since this is kind of whistle stop tour, I'm just going to sum up embodied cognition in this way. It, it sees mind as a system of self-constituting processes in which domain-specific actions are layered to give rise to more complex behavioral outcomes without the aid of a central processing unit yielding a representational model of the world. 
So now, going back to the philosophical problem that I talked about, I'm going to propose a third option. And um, then I'm going to illustrate a few ways in which I think embodied cognition supports this third option. And this option is hylomorphism, often known as hylomorphic dualism. And a brief rundown of hylomorphism, it's an Aristotelian view of the relationship between form and matter. It was later adopted by Thomas Aquinas and adapted by him to fit Christian theology. And it describes the soul as the form of the body. And he describes this as similar to a wax impression. So the soul is the impression in the wax. They're not two separate substances, but the soul is the kind of organizing principle of the body. And to understand what this means, it's necessary to understand that for Aristotle, there are four types of causes. There's the material cause, that out of which something is made. There's the efficient cause, which is the source of its change. There's the formal cause, which is the essence of the thing, what makes a thing this thing rather than the other thing. And there's the final cause, the thing for which that thing is, its purpose, a goal. And in modern science, we often reduce the word cause to only this efficient cause. In other words, it's a kind of external push and pull principle um, of movement and change. But if we look at these causes as types of explanation or layers of explanation, we see how ontology fits in because as Michael Dawes says, for something to be a cause, it needs to have an element of ontological dependence. And so for, for Aristotle, for anything that exists physically, the four causes operate as principles of that existence. There is no matter without form. Matter without form would be what Aristotle calls prime matter. Um, and prime matter exists only in pure potentiality. In fact, it is potentiality, and the form is what actualizes this potentiality. It's the actualization potential principle. And this means that unlike when we think of matter in the kind of current modern colloquial sense, it's not matter as opposed to a non-physical realm somewhere else, but rather there are levels of explanation that cannot be explained away embedded within the existence of the physical world. But there's a necessary further step when we talk about the soul of a living thing, because soul is the form of the body, but it's a dynamic form, an organizing principle. And the fact that an animal or a human being or even a plant is a living thing is an important distinction. And just to clarify here, it's the soul, the soul that is the substantial form of the body. There's not kind of one form for the body is matter, the thing that shapes it like a statue. Um, and then the soul, in addition, is some kind of active principle. So the traditional medieval idea, um, as Eleanor Stump says, is of a bronze statue. And the form of a bronze statue is accidental form. But this would be substantial form. Um, and so there's no kind of, oh, I have the shape of a body because there's a form that organizes my body. And then there's a spirit infused that's the active principle. The active principle and the form are the same organizing principle for Aristotle in a living being. And so as Eleanor Stump says, and I quote, is in virtue of this one form, a human being exists as an actual being, as a material object, as a living thing, as an animal, and as a human being with cognitive capacities. And so because of this, we need to look at the whole human organism first and the different faculties and functions which come from it being this sort of a being, the sort of a being it is with its form or soul. And then we can differentiate faculties out from that rather than building up in a parts oriented way. And I'm just going to conclude by showing a few resonances of how this view might mesh with embodied cognition. First, it's to highlight the fact that in embodied cognition, as in hylomorphism, emergent properties and processes have an important ontological status. In embodied cognition, the organism is a process, and this process is the self-organizing process. It's not a thing in the sense that a Cartesian homunculus is a thing. It is a process itself. And in embodied cognition, it is the whole system that acts, developing and changing itself as it interacts with the environment through structural coupling. And this extends the definition of cognition so that any living organism has what Giovanna Colombetti calls affect dash cognition. Affect is essentially an affect cognition, so cognition in, in this embodied cognition definition is essentially just a non-apathy towards one's own existence. And because of this non-apathy, an organism emerges as an already, already existing in a world of value because the goal of the system is to continue to maintain itself. And so there will be things that it moves towards or away from. Um, even this is organisms that don't have brains or consciousness. They have this type of cognition. And in a sense, this is a kind of teleology that we find in biology, as Seth was talking about, um, because teleology in Aristotelian terms is a type of final cause. But this is not teleology in the sense of a conscious goal, external design, or an agent directing an intentional purpose. So as Mary Midgley puts it, and I'm going to quote from her at length, she has a really good summary. The word teleology does not just cover 
conscious human purposes, but the whole of function. Aristotle, who first worked out this form of explanation, never thought of it as arising from the purposes of a creative God. He used it simply for the kind of questioning which asks what particular things are for and what they do for the organism that owns them. What is their telos, their end or aim in the context where they belong? As he pointed out, this kind of reasoning is so indispensable in biology and the aims it seeks are, so, are usually so obvious that no other way of thinking can displace it. It is simply a fact that organisms constantly strive toward their own survival, their health, their well-being, their general fulfillment and their reproduction. And indeed, embodied cognition, and that's the end of the quote, embodied cognition says that organism and world co-create the world as a domain of distinctions according to the affordances that the environment provides for the specific type of, type of embodied organisms that navigate it. So we don't just see objects in the world in another, in another way of saying it. We see things automatically with this affective filter as how they are relevant for us as the type of embodied beings that we are. So a branch to a bird is a place to sit, but for a child, it's a place to hang a swing. And this is um, J.J. Gibbs' theory of affordances, and J.J. Gibbs in his ecological psychology was kind of a precursor to embodied cognition. And since this self-organizing system has a goal for maintaining the self-organization of the system, things that have value for this purpose become affordances in the environment in accordance with the individual organism's goals. I'm not the first to suggest this connection between kind of Thomist Aristotelian hylomorphism and body cognition. There's an increasing, it's still quite small, but an increasing amount of research that's being done into this. I've only found kind of a few, but they say very similar things, which I find interesting. The theologian Bruce Pelosi, for example, has started to point out uh, connections between um, perhaps Aquinas's account of virtues and habits. Grant Gillette has equally pointed out that embodied cognition seems to have more in common with an Aristotelian view of the mind. My conclusion then is that discussions of the body show um, should now look at how the body is more than just matter, when matter is understood purely as physical extension. All matter inherently has form if it exists, because form is one of the ontological conditions of existence, and a living being has not accidental form or shape, but substantial form, which animates it. And I wish that I had more time here to go into the Christian theological implications, but I'm just going to point the way in which this could be useful for Christian theology. Um, because if we make this connection between embodied cognition and hylomorphism, there's quite a large literature on Thomistic hylomorphism and how it can account for the continuance of the soul even after death. And this has been used quite a bit in Catholic theology. It's been a mainstay of Catholic theology for you know, quite a long time. And because this view of the soul as the form of the body also accounts for the thisness of each thing, the particularity, scholars such as Eleanor Stump and Daniel DeHaan have proposed that it by no means excludes the possibility of the soul continuing on after death with its own particular identity. I would recommend reading more of these authors to get an account of their view of Hylomorphism and how this works. Um, but in the end, there's, there's still this view that a human person is kind of not considered fully a human person while the soul is separated. So you need that entire organism for it to be a, human, a full human person. And this is just a general outline of the direction in which I'm just beginning to explore. Um, and it, that's that I think, I just think we need to rethink about how we talk about the body and not assume that discussions of embodiment need to somehow account for the body only as physical extension. Instead, I hope to open up the discussion to different types of causal relationships and seeing, um, seeing the soul as the active organizing principle of the body, its formal cause. And through this, we can begin to see that the body and soul are actually not separate at all, but rather just as sphereness makes a sphere, the living soul actualizes the body and gives it its thisness and its existence as an entire organism, a human being, or whatever type of living organism it is. Eleanor Stump makes this connection with Aquinas, saying that we can, see, we can say that the eye sees, but it would be more appropriate to say that the human being sees. And she quotes Thomas Aquinas when he says, we can say that the soul understands in the same way that the eye sees, but it would be more appropriate to say that a human being understands by means of the soul. Likewise, the body then, the living body, is not just the shape of flesh. It is a living act and organ of perception that interacts with the world and co-creates a world of significance by its acting and perceiving. And I would like to plant the seed that perhaps the benefits of embodied cognition is that it breaks down the dichotomy between embodiment and cognition, moving past dualist models of the mind, which separate matter and form, 
relegating them to a split world in which physical and non-physical are somehow two separate realms that need to be made to communicate in ways not native to them or disappear altogether. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, embodied cognition can helpfully explain all sorts of things like the baseball field runner and those robots you mentioned, but can it, is it really needed in the case of, say, a mathematician working out calculations in her mind? Yeah. Yes, there's a great book that I haven't read yet by Rafael Nunez and uh, Mark Johnson, I believe, who is one of the linguists who looked in body cognition, and it's called Where Mathematics Come From. And they argue that, in fact, even mathematical calculations do come from embodied experiences. Oh, yeah. I haven't read it. What I would say to that is probably it also comes out of the fact that language is an emergent property of our body, and in the sense that we, we have lots of overlapping metaphors for understanding abstract concepts. So um, Mark Johnson goes and Lakoff and Johnson go into yeah. detail and how these metaphors grow in overlap. And so, you know, we have this idea of higher is more, you know, stock market price or rising, whatever, you know. Um, and that's built off of our physical interaction with the world, seeing if you pile stones up, you know, it gets higher. So there's this idea of kind of overlapping more and more abstraction, but at, at the base, it's the body's interaction with the world that these emerge from. And I don't know exactly how they account for mathematics, but I know that they do try to do that. It reminds me of an anecdote um, by oh, Feynman. He was talking about how they used to give them these maths problems, but they would only give them a time, they would give them basically just not enough time to actually calculate them out. And so whoever finished within the allotted like 30 seconds or something, they would get a prize. And he started to learn how actually there wasn't time to work through the math problem logically. So he had to start intuiting what needed to be done. And he started to learn through int intuition how then he could get at the answer. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the fascinating presentation. I was just wondering, with regards to new materialism, uh, where do you stand? Because they also speak about the autonomy of uh, uh, each matter and it can decide for itself, its agency, etc. So I was just wondering where you locate yourself in relation to contemporary discussions on new materialism, Rosie Bragarty. Yeah, I'm not familiar as much with the new materialism. Is it that even inanimate matter has this sense of self-directedness? Yeah. Can you can you do a quick summary of what? Right, so so um, basically, they would um, they like you know similar to what you said. It, it's not human cognition as such, but yeah. each 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 matter is vibrant. Yes, so yes, yes. It can decide for itself. And it's yes. So, I think that there would be obviously you have to have the st structure of the environment. So there's a whole question about free will and environmental stimulation. But I I would say that if we're looking at the difference between animate and inanimate matter, I think there is a really big difference between those two that's often not accounted for. So if you look at Thomistic hylomorphism, for example, I really like Eleanor Stump's analogy. She says that the human soul is an amphibian in that it is both a constitutor and it is constituted. And so it kind of Whereas like angels are just constituted souls without constituting matter, then you have rocks which just constitute matter. The form just constitutes matter without being constituted itself. And then in the middle you have kind of animate organisms which um, are both constituted and constituting. I think she calls them constituting constitutions or something. Anyways, it doesn't really matter. But, but the point being that, um, yeah, you do kind of have to make a distinction there, I think, between inanimate and animate matter because the form of inanimate matter is in some sense a, a different kind of form as for animate matter because it's not also self-constituting if that makes sense. Can I ask, I'd, quite, I'd like to know more about embodied cognition and so for this practical outcomes. I'm almost surprised how given the suffering and illness is ubiquitous, I mean we're all, you know, so, such a vast human experience, how little philosophy or phenomenology yeah. is done on the body when it goes wrong. Yes. And you know, going forward, what's the kind of are there useful practical outcomes to an embodied cognition that takes seriously the epistemology that could come out of illness and suffering? Yeah, that's such a good question. I really like Francisco Varela as an embodied cognition theorist because he started out trying to account for 
the qualitative aspects of human existence and trying to define those in a way that could be explicable scientifically. So he was all about human experience and he tried to combine cognitive science with Buddhist traditions of mindfulness. And so this idea that actually it's inherent in the mindfulness tradition that you don't go looking for when you go looking for yourself you don't find it and that leads to existential suffering because you think well this should be here but it's not i'm nothing you know uh, but then that in the buddhist tradition you can kind of lean into that and you realize that the self you're looking for is the ego self and actually if you let that go you can actually be invested in the experience of your body and i think at a practical level things like um you know gestalt therapy is really important where when you're talking about experiences you don't just narrativize them but you feel them and you feel them in relation to someone else so there's a sense in which your own experience of your own body locating where that is i mean the body keeps the score is a perfect example of how our body holds information and i think if this is taken seriously epistemologically it means that our subjective experience has information about the world that we need to listen to well, yeah, thank you so much for your, for your talk. I mean, that was incredible how you were able to explain embodied cognition and high level market dualism <laughs> so, so, so quickly and clearly. Um, so I guess my question is, um, if, if you had all seen the um, Michael Gazzaniga's split brain studies, um, where there's kind of like these two loci, loci of, of consciousness. So essentially, they, they cut the brain in half along the corpus callosum. And, uh, different halves of your brain uh, correspond to each eye, and so they essentially show people different um, uh, 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 photos of different objects according to the eyes, mm -hmm. and so just all these kinds of things you're saying about um, mutually constituting relationships between um, and, um, and and even the kind of affordances. Uh, it's it's like interesting if you if you watch some of these studies that there there really do seem to be kind of two centers of agency that are being. Kind of conceptualizing the world in terms of different uh, affordances the one side of your brain being more verbal the other side being more um uh, uh, intuitive yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. And so i wonder like with cases like that or with um you know split personality multiple personality things um I, I, i'm just wondering kind of if that problematizes the hylomorphic view and particularly when you're talking about like the intermediate state that daniel and and, and eleanor stump talk about i mean that seems to be a case where you say like Hey, in the intermediate state, like if you have multiple personality disorder, which which, which personality wins out? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really great question. I haven't read that particular study, but I've read some of Ian McGilchrist, who okay. works with uh, brain modalities and right brain and left brain. And it's really interesting, actually, because he does talk about the right brain mode of thinking is one that kind of can take paradoxes to, into account. It's environmental bath, so to speak. It pays attention to everything that's going on holistically, while the left brain is very logical. And then he, he has a lot of interesting studies about this. One that sticks in my mind is looking at fish and other animals, and that they tend to attack prey on the what is it right side which accords with the left side of the right side of physically which accords with the left side of the brain because that's more specific and then while the other apparently is kind of scanning the environment to see if if you know so the, the holistic side is taking account of the whole environment while the left side is aiming and killing the prey so yeah. so that's really interesting i think what someone like thomas aquinas and presumably john and stump would say about split personality is that actually the the personhood does not come at the level of conscious so split personality doesn't actually cause a problem for consciousness or excuse me for for personhood but rather it's a malfunction of the body at some to some extent and so it's a body that's not functioning quite well in a way that you know if you lost an arm you would still say you're a person right but there would be some way in which the soul was not being completely manifested in all its potentiality because it's so there's a sense in which identity is then, I think, in a really helpful way, not tied to our own identity of ourselves or our personality. And then I think that's a bit more of a holistic way of looking at things because then we don't equate it just with rationality, pure and simple, which causes problems for, first of all, animal ethics, but also then, you know, disability and all of these states in which we're actually, also we like to think we're more conscious and more aware than we are. So, you know, what, what does that happen? You know, Descartes' view of animals as mechanical is such an interesting one because like animals are really, really smart, you know, so, and sometimes people aren't. And so what, how do you gauge this, you know, if it's using this linear, intelligent, rational standard, or even consciousness of oneself, that could actually exclude a lot of humans from this category of personhood. Thank you, we need to stop there. Thank you so thank much. You so much. <laughs>